We have new information dropping about the Bamboo Lab H2D, including servo motors. Stick around. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. So we have more information about the up upcoming printer from Bamboo Lab, the H2D. So in the last couple of days, they've dropped a couple of new pictures. I didn't do a video on the last drop, which occurred a couple days ago, because it was more info on the tool head. And there is some information to learn about, so we're going to go dig into that. But today they dropped another picture, and that one reveals the use of servo motor. So we've got a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. We're gonna come and take a look at the, again, this is the Bamboo website, and this is the first picture, the one here on the left. We're gonna blow that up. So we have our title, The Beauty of Mechanics, Bamboo Lab H2D, Rethinking Personal Manufacturing, which we're gonna come back to, and then the release date. So let's dig into this picture. We're gonna go over here to Photoshop, and again, I've increased the brightness on this picture so that we can take a look at many of the important things. So, a lot to dig into here on this device. I'm looking at my little note sheet here. So first thing that we can see, we now have linear rails. So it looks like in, on this printer, they're getting away from the rods that were used on the X1 Carbon and on the P1S. So now we have linear, linear rails like on the A1 series. And the belts, some people have noticed these look to be thicker or wider belts, so probably better for strength and speed. So that's the first thing. Then it looks like up here we've got some gearing and motoring. I'm guessing this little motor and gearbox is for deciding which of the two extruders is in use and probably placing it in line with the uh, drive system. Talking about the drive system, it looks like we have a, a, a direct drive. Now there could be something kind of like Prusa uses where they have planetary, planetary gears for more precise control behind it. I don't know. But we can see we've got the little notches. Let me blow this up a bit. Here you can see the little notches here in this extruding wheel. And then we have kind of the pressure rollers here on either side. So you're going to have, you know, there's one on either side of this, uh, depending on which extruder is in use. Moving down a little bit, we have, here we have another motor and gearbox. And I'm guessing that this one is controlling which of the two extruders is in use and again it looks like as opposed to that original pivoting design these are either you know up or down so in this picture we can see that this nozzle is down and this nozzle is up next we can see the quick release spring clamps here again like are on the a1 series so that's a good addition that's going to be making that will make changing out the extruders the nozzles much easier I change them out on my A1 all the time because it takes less than 30 seconds. I very rarely change them out on my P1S because you have to unscrew things, you have to unhook the cables. You know, it's just a, it's not super hard. It's easier than it is, you know, on my Prusa, but it's still involved. So we've got this going for us now. And then this is a very interesting piece right here. So one of my fears was with a dual extruder setup, You've got one nozzle printing while the other nozzle, as it's you know either heating up or cooling down, some filaments tend to ooze or drip. So now we have this little you know bar that looks like it gets put into place to cover the unused nozzle, and that's going to prevent things from dripping into um, our workpiece. And then the final thing that we see here in this picture is this little box right over here to the to to my right. Not 100% sure what it is, but it could be something like the LiDAR that we see on the X1 Carbon tool head. These here are your air, you know, your air ports for cooling at the nozzle area, but we've got this little box over here, so maybe this will have a LiDAR. So that's what we, that's at least what I've learned from this picture, but now let's talk about what dropped today. So we're gonna come back over to Bamboo Labs website and this is the picture that they released early this morning. And it says the real servo motors. So again, let's go back over to Photoshop. We'll take a look at this one. Nothing, you know, ultra remarkable here. We can see that it says FAM013. It's probably the part number. 
24 volt DC, 0.5 amps. So that's a 12 watt motor made in China, engineered by Bamboo Lab. Then, we, so we've got the housing, we've got our electromagnet set up here, a bearing, we've got the armature, the magnets, more housing, and then back here we have probably the encoder for the servo motor, and we'll talk about that a little bit here in a second, and then the housing. So, why are servo motors important in a 3D printer? I want you to think about speed. So, before we get into that, let's talk about the difference between a servo motor and a stepper motor. So right now our 3D printers, most of them, the Bamboo Lab ones, have stepper motors. So think about this circular design. I've, this is just a coin that I've made and I know it's not in focus. It doesn't really matter. It's just a circle. But a stepper motor works by steps. You take a circle, it's got 360 degrees. Most stepper motors, when you send it a pulse, it moves 1.8 degrees. So I send a pulse, it rotates slightly, 1.8 degrees. So that, do the math, it takes 200 pulses to go 360 degrees around, right? That means it's very discrete. It's, it's only ever turning in these discrete values. You can get more precise than that by doing micro steps, which we're not going to get into here, but that's a basic way that these things work. Now, in a stepper motor, it's called an open loop system. There is no feedback. It doesn't know when the, when the controller sends that pulse, it assumes that the stepper motor made that little tick, but it has no way of knowing. If your print head, you know, or the tool head, if it hits something, if there's drag on the nozzle, whatever the case may be, if it sends that pulse, but the, the motor can't actually turn, that's called a misstep. The system has no way to, of knowing that. So that's where you run into things like, you know, layer shifts. So not a, you know, it's an acceptable thing for kind of budget equipment, if you will. But the solution to that, or one solution, is a servo motor. A servo motor works differently. It doesn't, it doesn't move in those discrete steps. It has a continuous current that's going through it, like most motors that we're used to. And so it's constantly rotating. But then you have a system, like this decoder, encoder here, that tells it, it always knows exactly what has happened. And so if there is a situation, it can sense that, you know, you don't have missteps like that with these servo motors. Now the servo motors, because of, you know, different technology, et cetera, they can run at higher speeds, they have higher torques, they just have advantages that you don't have with stepper motors, but they're more expensive. So you tend to only see them in higher cost devices. So I'm gonna make some analogies here. And I'm going to go back to step, or excuse me, servo motors are a lot more common, at least currently, in laser cutters. So, Trotec is a company that's been using servo motors in their lasers, and they are much more expensive than a lot of the the items that we typically typically use, like my Ohmtech laser, etc. So they have a great page here. I'll probably put a link here in the uh, description um, in case you want to read it. Um, but one of the things that you gain with that is you gain some quality because again, you're not doing those discrete steps. So it's less common to see like little tiny jagged edges on your prints or, or your cuts when you're using those servo motors. But again, let's talk about speed. So going back to the lasers. So again, tech is what I have. That's what I'm used to. This is very similar to the to the unit I have. I have a 28, a 20 by 28, 60 watt cutter. But you can see here, 600 mil millimeters per second. That is the uh, max speed of my particular unit. Very rarely do I use that speed. They have a Pronto line, which also uses stepper motors. And let's see, somewhere on here, da, 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 da. I had this all set up originally. I'm going to have to edit some of this out. Where is it? Bum, 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 bum. Okay. It was here all the time. So they have this Pronto series and you can see here that it has a maximum engraving speed of 1000 millimeters per second. Again, still using servo motors. Now they also have a Pro model and the Pro model here has a 1200 millimeters per second max speed, but they are using hybrid servo motors. Now a hybrid servo motor is simply a stepper motor that has that closed loop system. So it knows what's happening when it sends the pulse. And because of that, it can operate at higher speeds. It's kind of, it has a, 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 an ability to do error correcting. 
Now, when we look at the Trotec laser series, and like I mentioned, the ones that they have that use servo motors, the speeds are way different. And coming right here, when we look at the max processing speed, they rate in meters per second, not millimeters per second, but meters per second. Their slowest machine is 1.5 millimeters per second or 1500 millimeters per second. And they go all the way up to 4.32 or over 4,000 millimeters per second. These are very fast machines. All right, enough about lasers. Why does this matter for a 3D printer? Well, it's about speed and again, we're talking about personal manufacturing. So think about it. If you've got a bamboo X1 carbon and you're using this in a personal manufacturing or a small business where you're doing like rapid prototyping, your X1 carbon, its max speed is 500 millimeters per second. What if the H2D is twice as fast? So now imagine you're, you've, you know, you've 3D designed some part that you're gonna use in your next product and you wanna make sure things are good, rapid prototyping. It's a 12 hour print. You come into work, you start the print. That's not gonna be done until after you leave for work. You're gonna to have to come back the next day, see how it is. Hey, is there something that you need to change? A little tweak here, a little tweak there. Print it again, it's gonna take another 12 hours. What if the H2D is twice as fast? What if it can print it 1,000 millimeters per second? Now that 12 hour job became a six hour job. Now you can go to, you know, start your print, go to lunch, come back, see what you got. What if it's three times as fast? What if it only takes you, you know, four or whatever the math is, three hours now to print that? Before lunch, you, you know, you start your print before lunch, you got the part. If you need to do another iteration, you can have a second one done, you know, in the afternoon. So time is money. So this could be a huge advantage in the 3D printing world. Now, you will be limited by the flow rate. We don't know what the flow rate is going to be on the nozzles of the H2D yet, but obviously if they're speeding things up, then hopefully they've uh, cracked that. So that is what we have today. We now know that we're going to have servo motors on the H2D. So I don't know, is that something that you're excited about? Obviously this printer is not targeted to somebody who wants to print, you know, 16 color flexi dragons. It's not the audience that this is being designed for. They've already said that this is going to be in a tier above the X1 Carbon. So we've talked about price, but this is, again, manufacturing. So speed is gonna be a good issue. What do you think? Are you excited about a speed increase? Does that change your mind on whether or not this printer is for you? You, you know, my most common thing that I see is people wanted a bigger printer, more build size. Nobody's really said I want a faster printer. But what do you think? Drop your comments below. I would appreciate hearing from you all. So as always, if you enjoy what I'm doing here on the channel, I'd appreciate it if you take a minute, hit the like button, hit the little notification bell, and hit the subscribe button. I am almost at 3,000 subscribers. That's super exciting. I think I'm only like eight or nine away. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. As always, I appreciate the time that we get to spend together on the channel, but let's just keep on learning, burning, printing, and growing together. Take care, everyone.